Welcome to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Dwayne. I'm Susan Laielli, Communication Director for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106 FM in Fort Myers, or of course, anytime at the dioceseofvenice.org website. Don't forget dioceseofvenice.org slash bishop. Most Reverend Frank J. Duane, welcome back to Relevant Radio. Susan, thank you. Bishop, we usually open our program with a prayer. Would you like to lead us in prayer this morning? I will, and I think we continue with some difficulties with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we'll say a prayer for those who suffer from it and those who care for them. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, our divine physician, we ask you to guard and protect us from coronavirus, COVID-19, and all serious illnesses. For all that have died from it, have mercy. For those that are ill now, bring healing. For those searching for a remedy, enlighten them. For medical caregivers helping the sick, strengthen and shield them. For those working to contain the spread, grant them success. For those afraid, give them peace. By your grace, O Lord, may you turn the evil of disease into moments of consolation, and hope. May we always fear the contagion of sin more than any illness. We abandon ourselves to you in your infinite mercy. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop, so much. I don't know if you feel the same way. Where did another year go? I don't know, but we're ending one, Mm -hmm. a liturgical year, and we're starting a new one. And like the calendar year, it flew by. It did. It's another year gone by. And just in a few short days, Sunday, November 29th, we'll begin the season of Advent uh, with the first Sunday of Advent. So when I when I ask you, Bishop, what comes to mind when you hear Advent, the word? The word. I, I suppose expectation, preparation. Expectation we all kind of understand from when we were a kid because Christmas is coming, huh? Yes. But it's a different kind of expectation, of course, for Jesus Christ in our lives and to to once again enter into that spirit, but also one of preparation to set aside the time, not just for shopping, but to take the time to orient ourselves more toward the Lord and toward the great event that takes place within salvation history, and we prepare for it. Also, other things come to mind like, okay, the color of vestments going to change. Uh, let's see, uh, no more glory is at the Mass for a while. And those kinds of things enter my mind. The, should we say the things, the tone of what we're reading now also changes, whether that's in scripture, whether that's the breviary uh, that some pray daily, there's a new tone and and it changes and it's noticeably different. So those are some of the internal and external, if we could put it that way. On today's program, we will get into some of the finer points of Advent, and I'm really looking forward to that. Please don't let me forget to come back to the tone. I I like what you just said there, and I want to come back to that. But on today's show, we welcome Sean Myers to Relevant Radio. Sean serves as the Director of Worship for the Diocese of Venice. Hi, Sean. Welcome. Good to be here. We're so glad you joined us. First and foremost, the Office of Worship in a Diocese. What exactly does that office do? What do you do as its director? Sure, sure. So one of the important things to know about any Office of Worship is that in a diocese, the bishop serves as the chief liturgist. He governs and leads the church's worship in that diocese. Mm -hmm. And so the Office of Worship sort of supports and aids him in his role in that fashion. On a practical level, some of what the Office of Worship might do or coordinate, cooperate with other diocesan departments or um, parishes on big liturgies. Uh, for example, the annual rite of election for the RCIA that comes up at the beginning of Lent mm-hmm. and provide resources as needed, for example, like the annual Advent and Christmas newsletters. So you do quite a bit. I, I guess you would be the go-to guy when it comes to liturgy uh, appropriateness. Is this appropriate? Is that not appropriate in the Mass? Yeah, sure. You're right, Susan. You're right, he is. <laughs> Does he tell you, Bishop? Well, not only tell me, but I, I go to him and say to him, you know, what what has the Church said recently on this aspect? What, has something changed? There is a new document out on this issue. And Geeks like Sean and I will sit around and talk about what does that mean or 
we get a notice about some aspect from Congregation for Sacraments, and we go, okay, this has to be shared with all the priests. So then I turn to Sean and say, okay, let's, let's, let us get together a memo on that. And so we get a draft and work it out. It's a very important role when you think about um, the gap between you and the priest. You have to have somebody like Sean in the Office of Worship to communicate those messages down. And not every one of the priests, they're practitioners of the liturgy. Not everyone has a, a doctorate degree and just took the time to, whether they wanted to or not, got forced into submerging themselves into some of these issues and know them instinctively. So my first question then for each of you, and Bishop, we'll start with you. What is the purpose of Advent? What What is the design purpose of the season? You know, we kind of take a historical look because what you say draws that out of us. And if we go back, we find that Advent hasn't always been around. It kind of perked up from, well, the, a French culture, if we can put it that way. It came out of France and initially had a bit more of a like Lenten tone to it. Really, you know, recent history for liturgy is really Vatican II, where the Second Vatican Council came out with a document, you know, changed the uh, language, it became the vernacular of the people. But it also did things about the Advent seasons and put it more into that tone. I I don't want to steal your question from you later, but put a tone of a more joyful, a little more upbeat. Now, some things survived it, hung on to the color of vestments like you see, similar to what you see during Lent. The Gloria was left out of the liturgy during that time, but clearly the penitential tone that it had earlier kind of went away. So that we see. But really, the Second Vatican Council put that whole idea of this has to be a more joyous time as we start out our our church calendar year. Let's start on a high note of joy. And I think they did that. In the change, and the transition. Oh, in the changes that came out, certainly from Vatican II. Sean, what about you? What do you? How do you interpret the purpose of Advent? Well, Advent, I think, definitely has, as Bishop said, a joy and a sense of expectation as we look to the two comings of Christ, really. We think about Christmas is coming, so we think about the coming of Christ at the Nativity, but it also has a sense of the coming of Christ at his second coming. And this, again, is a longing for Jesus' return. Uh, It's joyful. To borrow a bit from the opening prayer from the first Sunday, we ask God for the resolve to run forth to meet Christ with righteous deeds at his coming. And so there's an eagerness to it as well. Okay, so that expectation, that eagerness is not just about the Christmas presents, really. We need to think about the birth of Jesus, but also the second coming of Christ. Yes, yes, it's definitely both there. When we describe Advent to people, how do you describe it, especially, you know, in the newsletter that you send out, you know, across the diocese? And Sean, maybe we start with you since you help Bishop with this. Um, what what do you explain to people regarding Advent and describing it? Oh, well, yeah, sure. We look to its twofold character, as I said, in the time of preparation. And it's a time of expectation and waiting. And I think we describe it as that. Bishop, you must have an affinity now to purple as we think about the color changing and the colors changing for Advent. Um, you must have an appreciation for that. I do. I like the color purple. I have to say that it was one of the high school colors where I went to high school. But more importantly, the expression it gives to the particular seasons. And this shade of purple, sometimes you'll see blue used. Blue is not an accepted color to be used in vestments. But it's a purplish blue that is used as opposed to the, or a violet color, as opposed to the various shades of purple you see in the the Lenten season. But yeah, I, I do like the color. And it's a time, as I said, you know, that we kind of look now and the long expected Jesus. And we sing, even the hymns we sing are about that idea. O come, O come, Emmanuel. It's that idea of coming. We look to the Old Testament, our brothers and sisters in Christ, they waited centuries for the Messiah to come. The Messiah came, Jesus Christ came. And now we have to, we commemorate some of that biblical journey that we all are part of that biblical history. And we look back to our ancestors and condense into a year, okay, 
here's our expectant time. Here's that time where we anticipate, we prepare, we wait for the coming of Christ. So let's discuss then the Advent wreath and the symbolism there and the various colors that are associated with that. I'm not sure which one wants to take on that challenge, but uh, it's a beautiful I'll just time say a to... few things, and then Sean, yeah. Sean always fills in. Uh, he's done all the studying. He knows it. Like I said, Advent kind of came out of France. The, the re- Advent wreath got added by Germany, a tradition that was in Germany, and it, it, it came about, found its way there. The different candles used, four weeks of Lent, four calendars. What color are they? They're purple. In the middle of that, the Sunday that arrives in the middle is usually the third Sunday, Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete means to rejoice. It's a little bit, we're halfway through it. Kind of hearkening back to that penitential tone it once had. Now we were halfway through, let's celebrate. We got to stay with it, but celebrate that halfway through and rededicate ourselves. So that wreath has that rose-colored candle. Investments that Sunday, once again, rose-colored to announce, okay, we're halfway there, but don't lose the momentum. Keep it going and really celebrate, Sean. Yeah, I'd echo what Bishop said. And as well with Advent, as we move along through the season, we light more candles on the wreath. And so we're getting, the, the wreath is getting brighter. We're getting closer and closer to Christ, who is the light of the world. And so there is a continued movement towards that in our preparation. So let's move to some of the things that... Can I draw one thing? Of course, yeah. Because Sean said the word that we can't miss. That wreath is light, and light is Christ. And the readings that we have during that time, Christ is always the light. And each Sunday that light gets, because we're getting closer to his coming, that light intensifies with one more candle being lit on that wreath. So we can't forget the symbolism. Many times it's there, candles on the altar. Why? Light of Christ. So before we move into any of the other practical things that change in the church, let's bring up the tone here, Bishop. So you said something in the beginning. You said the tone of the readings would change. It Meaning what? They become more joyful? Well, it constitutes really a, a type of biblical spirituality that is there in what Holy Mother Church has chosen for the readings, even the ones that come out of the Old Testament. We have a whole series of Isaiah during that time. And the tone, okay, yes, they're using purple vestments, but the the readings are not the penitential ones we go through in the Lenten season, but they're much more upbeat about that anticipating Christ's coming. Even some of the celebrations that we have of other saints within that period. It's kind of alive with a lot going on. Mm, so there okay. is a tone of, whereas in the Lenten season, you're kind of, you got one note there and it's not jumping around much. Where the Advent season, no, that's, that's different. And even, like I said, not just the Bible, but the breviary readings, it becomes a season of joyful hope, really. And There can be no doubt in that when you take a look at at the liturgical, that joyful and spiritual expectation that the season really accents and highlights. I just think it's it's uplift. It's exciting. When you were in in a church at that time and you are preparing to celebrate Mass, the kids must be just ramped up by candle number four, right? I mean, are we are you having to tone things down in in the room? I mean, the kids must be bouncing off the seat. Well, every parish does a little bit differently. Sometimes you have a a family come forward and, you know, they're lighting that candle. And every parent does a little bit differently. Sometimes mom and dad will light it. Other times, if the children are young or not tall enough, let's get right to it. You know, one of the parents might pick them up and then they'll help mom or dad. I think we, we have to in these times, this has to be a family journey. This has to be not just a family of the faithful, the larger family, but also individual families. Because isn't that what we arrive at at Christmas? Isn't that what happens? Mm -hmm, That the family gets together with the tree and the house and the gifts and all of that. Maybe we've lost some of those traditions in our modern way, but I think it helps to hearken back to them. And I think with the Advent wreath, we do that. And, you know, the Advent wreath is one way. Sometimes it's the little open the door and there's a chocolate there. 
I remember that as a kid. Maybe I liked the chocolate more than the candle, <laughs> but it changes a little bit when you get older. So I think my point there is, I just think there's so much that can happen. And yeah, kids can get very excited and you can see it when you explain it to them. When they're real little ones, oh, I want to light the pink one. Mm, you know, it's just mm-hmm. there. They see it. It's different. Mm-hmm. And it strikes them. Yeah. they'll Out of the mounds of bed, they'll just say, it, yeah, I want to light that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the special one. <laughs> well, Sean, when it comes to preparing the newsletter, let's explain what that is so that our listeners understand some of the things that you do regarding these seasons. Sure, sure. With the newsletter, for example, the Advent newsletter, it'll include basic information like the dates coming up. Some of these things will be movable. Uh, so we need to know what date they're coming and communicate that. But it also will communicate changes that happen in the season, be it the color of vestments or different changes in the music. What else goes away? What else changes in the church when you are writing the newsletter and you think, oh, yes, we need to make this change or that change in the church? The big things that change in Advent, I think Bishop already mentioned this, is we do lose the Gloria in Advent. For the most part, it comes back for uh, the Immaculate Conception and some of the big feast days. But for the most part, that's that's lost temporarily, just, just for the four weeks there. Mm-hmm. And then... Flowers, I mean... Flowers, flowers, yeah, yeah. You know, we we see around us, I want to say, as we're out and about, you're visiting the mall, you're visiting the grocery store, everything's super decorated already for Christmas. But the church is a little bit more restrained in Advent. You know, it says that, I've got a quote here, you know, the floral decoration of the mm-hmm. altar should be marked by moderation suited to the character this time of year. So, you know, we want, we all, we want to put the points that is out. We want to put up the garland and the lights, but it's good to take a moment and wait there. You're listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio, airing on 1410 AM and 106 FM in Fort Myers. So when it comes, Bishop, to the changes in the church, is that is that difficult to get 61 parishes on board to, you know, to have this? Or are the priests trained so much so that they understand the season well enough? And Yeah, we're all working off the same text, mm-hmm. so to speak. I mean, they've studied in the seminary. Every one of us has gone through the liturgy class, been trained. So there's certain things you just instinctively pick up. The early assignment of a priest is very helpful in that way, because if you have a pastor who kind of lets you as a young priest, do these things because you learn by doing. And uh, if they train them in that way, I just, uh, one thing, and this is a bit of a change and maybe I'm robbing something you're going to ask in a little while. I think our pandemic this year changes a lot Hmm. that might normally have been done in the past, the way it's done, how it's done, you know, everything from distancing to not having that big choir up there singing too much if you want to say generating maybe too many molecules flying around in the air in case someone has COVID, uh, but still trying to find a way to keep the uh, instrumental, I'm thinking more organ or piano, and have a canter there to let some of the people hear everybody's masked in church, sing along under the mask. It's got a different sound. We don't, sure we won't does. call it beautiful, but it, it just takes on uh, with the virus. You know, we're not going to be able to put as many people, certainly in the churches. Mm-hmm. So we've been encouraging some of the priests to look at the possibility of how's your parish hall look? How's the gymnasium if you got one? How many people can you get in it? Uh, there's more than one priest at these larger parishes when they have those. Okay, can you do a, a parallel mass or start one at 10 and one at 10, 15? So that those who come at one point, you know, no, we really can't take any more. We'd ask that you would go over to the parish hall at this point. So this year has put, I think, that dimension, and not only for Christmas Day or anything, but the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, we have a huge Hispanic community in the diocese. That takes on a whole dimension of its own. And how to spread that out a little bit more and how to keep precautions sufficiently, should I say, before all, so that they they listen to them. So I think we we just have real challenges this year in that regard. And you've never seen anything like this, but people, you know, in, in front, in the pews, 
probably don't realize the level of fluidity that you're dealing with here at, at the diocese. Maybe you can describe what it's like to be you <laughs> at How this time. How do you time. mean in fluidity in what? That, that because of the pandemic, it's ramping up, it's coming down, it's ramping up again. You're, you know, you're always having to adjust and move things. So, how and and that... I well, I think we're called to do that, and the training. And uh, Sean is a great one to have here with me because of when it came time to come out with some of these memos we put out on some of the regulations, some of the suggestions. Not that every parish was able to do every one of them, but for the for the priest to have okay, here's it's all put in one place, mm -hmm. and we also learn from them. It's not just we learned well. How are you doing it? Well. Uh, we're not having the people come up for communion. We're going through the church in the rows. And some have kept that up, and they've the people have adapted very successfully to it. Others, you know, that didn't seem to be the way they felt best to have it done. And then to encourage parishes, some are still having distribution of the Eucharist later in the afternoon on Sunday or following their last Mass. If people want to come, and some do it, People are staying in their cars. For others, they're getting out of the car and coming to a person. So, too, when I'm out and about to listen, it, it, what they're doing, and then kind of, okay, that's great, or just take it away and say, have you shared that with some of the other pastors in the area? Because it, it seems to be very effective. Mm -hmm. So, and then I'll bring back and say to Sean, you know what I saw this weekend at such and such a parish? And we'll talk about, you know, how might we add that in somewhere? So it's, I think it's an effort of us all. By fluidity, if you mean, yeah, we got to be ready to change because, come on, we all thought this was kind of coming down, didn't we, at one point? We did. The levels were down. Right. Let's be honest. Well, they're not down now. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've extended the dispensation from the obligation to attend Mass. And this time didn't put a date on it, just kind of said, I'll be back to you in the new year and we'll see where this is. Because if we had a spike, and I think um, we'll, we can expect to see maybe following Thanksgiving, there might be a few more cases around. And then Christmas people, I think we just have to get back to, if you want to say, as close to normal as the new definition might be. And then we'll see where we go from there. Right. And Shauna, you probably agree. I mean, you, you have to find a way to get back to normalcy somehow, mm -hmm. some way in life. Yeah. You've got to take all the steps you can to be safe, but at the same time, be normal and try to get back, try to get back to normalcy. And some of that, too, with your virus precautions will be what can we do to be safe, but still preserve the heart of the liturgy, the, the integrity of the liturgy, um, maintain reverence and everything while still doing the things we need to do to be safe. So back to Advent a little bit now. What happens on uh, during weekdays in Advent, Bishop? Is there anything different that we can expect? Well, during weekdays, we talked about the color of the vestment, if that's what you mean, the celebration. The, the readings will be a little bit different. You know, the Advent candle for whatever week you're in, that can be lit during those weekdays also. Okay. So I, I was thinking kind of that, but also you've got some feast days in there. During the season, I mentioned Our Lady of Guadalupe for the Hispanic community. Also, San Juan Diego is right before that. And, you know, we continue to come up with some great celebrations. St. John of the Cross has a feast day that comes in on the 14th of December. And then during that time, there's a couple other saints as we prepare. St. Peter Canisius. And so we have to be attuned to that. Holy Mother Church has put that in there to, in a sense, lighten us up. I think we have to lead the people up to Gaudete Sunday also. Remember, I spoke of that You did kind of halftime. And um, it needs to be given that kind of encouragement. Come on, we're, we're moving through this. Don't forget why we're here, though, and why we do this. The rose-colored vestments, I know some priests don't like to wear them. They say, well, well we don't. So maybe they don't. But I think it's a tradition we have. And I think whether I think they're nice or whatever, it's not the point. Right. It's, okay, this is the tradition that Holy Mother Church has on this issue. And tradition is lovely. Sean, December 8th, the Immaculate Conception, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. What will be different during Advent? Immaculate Conception, again, solemnity, patroness for the United States, 
typically holy day of obligation, typically. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, and of course, the dispensation in place. But it's a day where we are a little more festive uh, during Advent. We'll sing the Gloria, and we'll, we'll give it a little more joy and emphasis there. And then we also have Our Lady of Guadalupe on the 12th, and the optional. What is the optional solemnity on the 10th? Oh, the optional memorial for Our Lady of Loretto there. Yes, yes that's, a, that's a, new, a new addition to the calendar. Last year, from Pope Francis has added it to the, to the general calendar. Now, it's always been on certain calendars in Europe. And it's, it's just another small Marian feast day that really helps us think about the incarnation. It's, it's optional, as it said, so priests don't have to celebrate it. They may, and there's certainly a benefit to it because it ties in well with the coming of Christmas. So, Bishop, in our remaining few minutes, how can families make their Advent special this year, make it different in a time of, of pandemic? You know, I think as the family units, they have kind of a, depending where somebody's going out to work and so on and so forth, but they they have that bond that they, they're with each other all the time. Mm-hmm. And so can develop, hopefully, I don't want to say an immunity, but are sharing some of these smaller germs that we do develop an immunity to, and hopefully then they'll have the strength to overcome something come in. But what to do? Uh, an Advent wreath at home, if you're not going out to Sunday Mass, let the children learn that. Maybe just the celebration of Advent, go out and get one of those and you know open the doors and have a little chocolate there. And everybody share. You know, there's not big pieces of chocolate there, at least I don't remember. But share a little bit. Don't you learn a huge dynamic? Family is all about sharing. Mm -hmm. I think parents certainly get that message, but I think it's that has to be passed on too to the children there. And to to get the idea of why what does the light mean? Why a wreath? That light of Christ. Christ is called the light referred to him, you know, others have called him that, but Christ also, that you and I were to go out and magnify that light of Jesus Christ and take the opportunity within the family to build up that unit of the family. Because after Christmas, we know we have a celebration of the Holy Family itself. But as we, uh, during that Advent season, let it be something we put a priority on, working on the family. And you know, it's a short time. It's only four weeks. And, uh, you know, families are together for years. Somebody's at home. But take the opportunity. I think sometimes um, a lot of grandparents say, oh, my grandchildren don't go to church or don't they? Well, take the opportunity to kind of reinstill that. And it's a good season, I think, to do it. Sean, what about you and your family? What will you do to make Advent special this year? Sure. I mean, it's definitely a, a great time for the family and as Bishop mentioned, the Advent wreath. My wife and I lo- love to keep an Advent wreath on our, our dining room table. We try to light it every night um, and have some Advent prayer with it. Maybe listeners might try the readings of the day or perhaps from a little missile at the prayer of the day. Another way really to, to keep Advent in the home is uh, Marian devotion. Mary is really a central figure in Advent. She comes up, of course, with as we approach the nativity, but in the feast days as well. And so uh, central, she's a central figure. And so Marian devotion, especially the rosary, the joyful mysteries in particular, provide a really fruitful contemplation on the incarnation at this time of year uh, that can really get us into Advent there. All right. Well, that was very helpful. This discussion on Advent will help many, many people. I think sometimes we just want to get to Christmas, and I think you're forcing us to slow down, and I like that. You're forcing us to pay attention to these four weeks, and I do appreciate that. You've been listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio, 1410 AM and 106 FM in Fort Myers. Our guest, Sean Meyer, Director of Worship for the Diocese of Venice, thank you very much. I'm Susan Laielli, Director of Communication for the Diocese of Venice. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane airs on the last Friday of each month. Of course, you can reach out to Bishop on Twitter at Bishop Duane and on Facebook at Bishop Frank J. Duane. Bishop, thank you so much. Susan, you're most welcome. Always fun to be here. We'll see you next time.